book in a bed. <laughs>
the while I was when we were doing our notes I was saying that you know Georgia and Bryony were thinking like fucking hell Quinn like put your shit together if you're unhappy leave and I'm like no <laughs> <laughs> so this is gonna be fun Ooh, juicy love a good book chat well this book when I read it so my best friend basically said to me I didn't really like it that much it wasn't one of my favorites and I was like oh I'm I'm gonna put off reading it so I put off reading it for a while and then one afternoon I was like I actually have the whole afternoon to read so I'm gonna smash out a Colleen Hoover book because that's what I do (laughs) and (laughs) fantastic work the first time I read this book I cried from basically like there's a big turning point that happens if you've probably already read the book if you're this this far in and when when you find out about the cheating situation I that was that was it for me I was like done and I loved it it overtook ugly love it was like hop, skip, mm. jumped right over to like being my second favorite because Ooh. I just loved this book. I don't know if it was because maybe I related to the situation that's happening in this book more than what I did with the book Ugly Love because mm. I would never let a man treat me the way that Miles Street <laughs> take for majority of that. I just wouldn't. But like in this book, it was real to me because you see the struggles of both and you you fight alongside them. You're there with them. And it was just everything. It absolutely broke my heart. And then it helped mend it back together. I loved the interchanging chapters. That's something that I absolutely loved. It made it so much more like emotive for me, like yeah. seeing how they were in conjunction to when they first meant to how they are now and I just I just fucking loved it so we start off at the beginning of the book and we meet a girl called Quinn basically she is I think she's coming home either from being away somewhere or yeah, she, yeah. she's away yeah she's coming home early to surprise her fiance Ethan and basically she gets to his apartment first of all the guy who opens the door he didn't smile at her and she's like what the fuck is going on why, do why you isn't the doorman me? happy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like something's happening here and she gets up to his apartment and there is someone pacing out the front of ethan's apartment and when she like gets to the door there's like this awkward exchange where she's like can i like get get to this door please and he's like you're is this your apartment? And she's like, it's my fiance's apartment. Um, and he's like, yeah, well, he's in there fucking my girlfriend. So <laughs> we have this hilarious moment where like, you know, initially, well, it's not that funny, but it is funny. Quinn's doing that. No, you've got the wrong house. And he's like, well, I absolutely do not because I followed her. And you're like, eh, red flag, but we'll avoid that. And then <laughs> she's like, Ethan wouldn't. And then I'm interrupted by it. The fucking. <laughs> <laughs> so bad oh. it's like the noise um, they're just like oh there it is and she's like the woman's like screaming like Ethan, it's so bad Uh-oh. i don't think i've <laughs> ever screamed out a name during yeah. the throes of passion oh well, i might have when i'm really drunk mm. never screamed it oh i've never screamed it i mean i probably like moaned it very loud <laughs> <laughs> so basically they're having an exchange at the front because she's like that fucking cunt and she's having this internal monologue and she's like oh my god I'm wearing a skirt and so it says Ethan likes skirts so I thought I'd be nice and wear one for him but now I want to take my skirt off and tie it around his neck and choke him with it and I'm like (laughs) I feel you sis I fucking feel you love your work honey bun no you don't want to be in that situation oh no worse enough finding out after the fact but actually hearing it so basically we meet graham who is dating sasha who is getting the fucking he's a, he's his little sweetie i actually like him i'm quite i'm quite interested in him already i, I love graham good banter so we get this little internal monologue again from quinn and she says i look at him and realize it's the first time I've actually taken him in. This might be one of the worst moments of his life, but even taking that into consideration, he's extremely handsome. Expressive dark brown eyes that match his unruly hair, a strong jaw that's been constantly twitching with silent rage since I walked out of the elevator, two full lips that keep being pressed together and thinned out every time he glances at the door. And I'm like, oh, hello. <laughs> hello, sir. <laughs> I know this is the worst moment of your life, but... But also the name Graham. Graham is something that people in our generation would call their pet. Yeah. It is. I really appreciated Quinn's internal monologue throughout this entire scene. She and Graham are clearly hearing Sasha scream Ethan's name. And she thinks they won't last long. Ethan can't last for more than a few minutes. (laughs) Sorry, Ethan. 
Endurance <laughs> just isn't your thing, buddy. That's all right. We all have our talents. Fucking is not yours, my dude. No, it's not. I love we get this next bit as well where they're sitting there but like on the floor staring at the door where their partners are fucking each other inside the room and then the elevator dings and the guy's delivering Chinese food and she's like hell no and snatches the bag from him and like Graham like pays the guy and then they just sit on the floor because apparently Chinese food after sex is her thing and she's like he is not taking my food and I loved her loved she that. won me that moment yeah and we get also this hilarious quote where they're sitting on the floor and they're eating their Chinese food and she's like whores I mutter and Graham just goes whores with no food <laughs> <laughs> I loved that interchange they're just so they're I so, love it yeah it was just it's making light on a situation which is so fucking shitty basically while they're eating their Chinese food they get this little moment where they're reading each other's fortunes so like they get the little fortune cookie out he reads his and it's some fucking weird thing and he's like it's like you win on a business endeavor or something like that and he's like yeah. okay whatever and then hers is this quote which it's like the book title and all of your beautiful you know it's, it's everything the fortune says if you only shine light on your flaws all your perfects will dim they chat and they get to know each other and we basically also find out during this that Ethan is a fucking dickhead. Yeah. Well, you get this monologue where she's like, oh, you know, we got a flat tire once and Ethan, like, you know, he wouldn't get it replaced. We had to get a tow. And he's like, oh, Graham's like, that's not actually that bad. She's like, no, the thing is, I knew how to change a flat tire and he wouldn't let me. He just refused to let me because it would have embarrassed him to have to stand aside while a girl changed his tire. Ugh. Oh, yuck. Ew. Move out the fucking way, you bitch. <laughs> is it a Tuesday night is it bad if I have four glasses of wine no no <laughs> but then we move on from there and we act, we get this fucking heartbreaker where you know it's been all these funny exchanges but really deep down it's not it's serious isn't it Graham turns around to Quinn and says you'll cry tonight in bed that's when it'll hurt the most when you're alone and I'm like ah well you know oh, I've got a fucked up brain <laughs> oh no I saw I'm you do something her, there, Bryony, and I was like, what is she giggling at? <laughs> you're, you're like, we get this heartbreaker and my brain goes, has that TikTok noise where it's like, it's it's not funny, is it? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. um, and then I lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> and then we basically hear the fucking has stopped and Graham like grabs hold of Quinn's face and he's like, don't show emotion. Let's be strong. Fuck it. They don't even look at Ethan and Sasha when they open the door. They're just like, no, nah, we're going, not even saying a word. They just grab each other's hands, move to the elevator, open up the elevator, and then we get this quote from Quinn. He hits the button for the lobby, and when the doors begin to close, I finally look up. I notice two things. One, Ethan is no longer in the hallway, and his apartment door is closed. Two, Sasha is so much prettier than me, even when she's crying. And I well, That's just, just rude. Yeah, fuck you, Sasha. You should be ugly. You should look like a fucking toad. And I feel really bad for them both in this situation. And so they go downstairs and basically Graham and Quinn go their separate ways. Quinn is going to her car, which is just like down the road a little bit. And Graham's going to walk home. He's like, I'll live around the block. It's fine. That's it. Chapter one was also, it starts with then. And the chapters jump between then and now. So that was then. Now starts off with pain. (laughs) Oh, it does. We start off this chapter with some quotes that literally break my soul in two. The first one being, our marriage didn't collapse. It didn't suddenly fall apart. It's been a much slower process. It's been dwindling, if you will. And fuck. Like, this one got me good because sometimes that's just the worst. It's not the, we have a big argument and now we're done. It's the, oh, months have passed and I now realise I bet it's not okay. That's like one of the things I think you figure out when you're getting older in relation. This is why this book is so fucking good because when you get older in relationships, you realise that the big fights don't mean as much anymore. It's Mm -hmm. the... The big, it's the small little bits and pieces that build up, build up, build up, build up until, and then it explodes at the top. And that's, they're the ones that kill you. Yep. Terrible. Also, side note, this was the first book we've read in a hot minute where I didn't think someone had died. Oh, good. That's what I thought you were going you. I was like, there's, I had no, no theories about murder, which was a refreshing take. You would hope yes. not because it is about dying. It's about non-fetuses not living. So. Yeah, I didn't make a yeetus fetus, so that's fine. <laughs> I love that me and Georgia just give each other these looks like, are we doing it? Are we doing it? Yep. And Ellie, Ellie's like, looking at us like, don't you dare. 
Don't, Ellie's like, don't you dare. Look, I am as much pro-choice as the next person, but there's a time and a place. No, exactly. But in saying that, last week, Ellie was the Ellie was both yeah, of us look. combined. Ellie was like, fuck it all. Last I was unhinged. Week. The next quote we get is, it's hard to admit that a marriage might be over when the love is still there. People are led to believe that a marriage ends only when the love has been lost, when anger replaces happiness, when contempt replaces bliss. But Graham and I aren't angry at each other. We're just not the same people we used to be. Sometimes when people change, it's not always noticeable in a marriage because the couple changes together in the same direction. But sometimes people change in opposite directions. Again, like we just said, it's super relatable. So relatable. Fuck. But that quote is followed up with the next part of it is, I've been facing the opposite direction from Graham for so long, I can't even remember what his eyes look like when he's inside me. Oh, God. Oh, Oh. And this is when I my first alarm bells start going and I'm like, Quinn, that's not good, girl. No, sex when there's no communication is just heartbreaking. Yeah, it's just, it screams like there is some serious underlying issues that need to be discussed here. Yeah. yeah. Sex it's, is like such an important part of any relationship when mm-hmm. stuff like and that. And that can like, be a lot of sex or not a lot. As long as you're both on the same page. Exactly. It's fine. Yeah. But when it becomes something else, it's just no. Nah. Yeah. So basically their marriage is falling apart. And we get, again, some more quotes because there's so many good quotes in this book. I know sometimes it must My feel like room. we just... We just quote hop. We're just like, rereading the book. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. We're like, page two. <laughs> okay. Page two. Everything's fine. <laughs> but the, these quotes are just fucking accurate. It's the problem is love and happiness are not concordant. One can exist without the other. And then this other one, which really got me, which mm. is he fills the room with his presence. I only fill it with my absence. Ugh. When he comes into the room in this moment, she's sitting there wearing her wedding dress and she's holding a wooden box and I mean imagine being your your come home and your partner sitting there like upset in a wedding dress you'd be like oh shit something's going on here <laughs> at this stage he's like looking at her with the box you can tell there's something happening with the box something's happening What's, mm. the, what's, what's the in the box? We what's don't know. in the box today? <laughs> we get this mention that he used to ask her about her dreams every morning, but now he doesn't. That got me. Ooh. And then they give a description of the divorce dance, and it's basically just the complete breakdown of communication that you both ignore so that you can continue living in ignorance, being unhappy. So the quote is, I call it the divorce dance. Partner one goes in for the kiss. Partner two isn't receptive. Partner one pretends he didn't notice. We've been dancing the same dance for a while now. And that is so spot on when you're just, let's just keep pretending like the wheels are turning. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. If we don't address it, it's not an issue. Yep. We get a little bit more information about their marriage here and just like their general lack of connection. And there's another quote, believe it or not, which is, I pretend to fall asleep before he even makes it to bed at night. I pretend I don't hear him when my name droops from his lips in the dark. I pretend to be busy when he walks toward me. I pretend to be sick when I feel fine. I pretend to accidentally lock the door when I'm in the shower. I pretend to be happy when I'm breathing. Oh, that's fucking rough. That is so rough. So clearly she's gone through it and she just doesn't want to tell him. And then we go from there and we actually find out that basically she hasn't been able to have a baby. So the quote is, again, quote hopping, but it's because there's so many good quotes in this fucking book. So many. The quote is, he wraps an arm around me and his fingers splay out against my stomach, a stomach that still easily fits into my wedding dress, a stomach unmarred by pregnancy. We just keep getting mentions of the box and she's in the wedding dress and the fur, the dirt, and all I know is that whatever's in that box, it is not good. Basically, in the chapter with this quote that it's hard to hold on to someone who has long since slipped away i don't reciprocate he releases me i exhale he leaves the bedroom we resume the dance oh oh god and then we jump to the next chapter which is another then moment and basically she it ends up pissing down with rain and they've both obviously left the apartment now ethan and sasha bye bye and she is like it's pissing with rain I wonder where Graham's gone. And she ends up like driving around the corner and she sees him run into a Mexican restaurant. So she pulls in, walks in there and sits down next to him at the bar. And they basically have this little like cute game of like noughts and crosses with the pretzels and they (laughs) share a toast. And Graham basically goes, I have absolutely nothing to toast to. 
fuck today. And then they drink their drink. And then they both have their exes calling them. So they decide to push their phones off the edge of the bar, smash, therefore like smashing them. Because it, it's a new start. They don't need their phones anymore. It's mm. their old life. They're, they're new people now. But okay. also that shit's expensive. Like I really hope they paid that extra $13 a month for insurance. Yeah, yeah they're just like, actually, no, well, Quinn is fucking wealthy. So her family's pretty well. But she's always saying that she doesn't, you know, she's not living. Mm. She doesn't like to ask people for money it's just like to use their mum's money whatever but we digress because we don't actually know that yet <laughs> so after you know they've had a couple drinks whatever graham basically finds out that sasha ran out of the building and um she was like where's where'd he go where'd he go and there was this interchange that graham told <laughs> quinn earlier on that was basically that sasha paid like some ridiculous amount of money it was like eight hundred dollars eight hundred dollars yeah on this word game so that she could beat graham in it and Wordle. it's just oh my like God. a fucking weird thing and basically Sasha runs out of the building she's like where'd he go and Quinn's just like I don't know and then she turns around like as she's getting into a car she's like actually no she turns around looks at Sasha in the eyes and she's like $800 on a word game Sasha really really and then gets in the car and drives away and I was like I love this and Graham seemed to love that too because he's like when he finds that out he's like actually this knee right here it's looking quite fiddly and he just runs his finger. <laughs> Ellie's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was into it. And then fiddling me, I'm like, oh. Ellie's doing a fucking Nesta curse finger at I, you. I am. <laughs> Look, it was meant to be a boy now. Like but then it, it came to knees and then it. <laughs> it started flaccid. So, yeah, all he says is, do you want to get out of here? I'm like, yes, sir. Take me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I don't yeah. mind that your name is Graham. I can overlook that. I can overlook <laughs> that you've probably got the name of some of my dad's friends. That's fine. Yeah, that's... Mm, no. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Actually, I can't. I'm going to just call you um, G from now on. G. <laughs> G. Um, G, which is... GQ. Awesome. GQ. GQ. Yeah. Oh. Cute. So then we jump from that chapter over into a now chapter and it's traumatic to say the least we find out basically that quinn is grieving she takes very long showers so she can cry and relatable whenever i'm fucking whenever i'm in a mood i am like don't fucking talk to me lock myself in the shower and just cry (laughs) i put my playlist on which is called stop collaborate and cry (laughs) i love that (laughs) we get like just again a fuck ton of quotes so buckle in again here we go so i feel weak for needing to grieve since no one has died it doesn't make sense that i grieve so much for those who never even existed and that's really fucking sad i'm not necessarily like i i do want to have children one day i don't want to have them anytime soon i'm like i think i'll probably have them closer to my 30s but i have friends that are wanting to have children now and i think like if something like this happened to them right, it would just fucking tear me apart so i can I have, imagine how it would be like for someone going through it i have friends right now that are struggling with fertility and they're going through all the motions and doing all the tests and like then in our friendship group we've also got people that have just announced their second child like, is on the way and like there it's that age group unfortunately and so a lot of them are getting pregnant while this couple is still struggling and it's just the grief there yeah is and it's just a whole other level and my heart goes out to everyone that's going through that you can't imagine it fucking awful honestly and then we follow that up with this next quote which is another very relatable quote which is one second i'm in the shower the next second i'm not I lose myself in the grief. I get so lost that by the time I climb my way out of the dark, I'm in a new place. This new place is me naked in front of the bathroom mirror. And like the amount of times that I've like lost myself in like a moment of just like crying my eyes out over something that probably is so nothing in comparison to this, but like something that is so soul destroying that I get out of the shower and I'm like, whoa, when did I get here? Or like I'm in bed and the next minute I'm making like a sandwich and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> when did this chicken sandwich get in my hand? You've done auto like, You've just stolen your neighbor's sandwich. And like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> <this> <laughs> bitch. <laughs> He's butt naked in the front yard mowing the lawn. And everyone's like, the fuck is she? Fuck me. Like, Karen, she's at it again. <laughs> 
here I am being like, your body just takes you into autopilot because it's just trying to protect you. And you guys are like, no, she's stealing chicken. Anyway, we all grieve different ways. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do. That we do. Anyway, so we basically find out that Quinn can't have children. That is the general gist of it. I was born. That's all I'm able to do until I die. I'm standing on the outside of the circle of life, watching the world spin while I'm at a standstill. And because he's married to me, Graham is at a standstill. At this moment, I am like, okay, no, you can't, you can't do that. You you can't say, oh, I'm making him do this. That's not how it works. He can make his own choices. If he wants to stay with you, that is his choice. Yeah, look, I guess this is the complexity of infertility though. Like your whole life just gets put on hold while you go through it. And like you said, Brownie, like you, people around you are experiencing the highs that come with that type of thing in your life. And it's everywhere around you. You can't escape it. I just, it's not like she stopped loving him or he started treating her terribly. Like there yeah. wasn't a cause to their breakdown she just became so consumed with getting pregnant I completely get that like it's just it's all encompassing like that's their entire life and it's it feels like it's only affecting the woman because it's their body Quinn is going through this physically not Graham it's different it's different when it's you if you're the woman taking peeing on a stick and going through the cramps and the blood loss and sitting in the women's assessment clinic around pregnant women while you're having a miscarriage that's you. It's not the man going through it. And I can completely understand how she loses sight of the fact that he would have his own feelings in relation to it because Mm. hers are just too much to cope with. Yeah. She's so consumed by what she's experiencing that she's then projecting those feelings onto Graham, even though we find out like nothing in his behavior is Mm -hmm. indicating that he feels like he's trapped, that he's at a standstill. He's actually hurting with her and is hurting because he sees how much she is hurting but yeah. she can't see it and if he does experience like display those emotions she's interpreting it as her fault yeah he's hurting because of her not for oh, her see it's so hard because i've never so been hard. in a position of someone who has who is has been pregnant <clears throat> or like my i'm still at the age i'm like i'm 24 so my friends are either starting to want to have kids or like I have a couple friends that have children that are, you know, around my age, but I don't have, I don't know. I don't know if it's because I'm not in that mindset. My yet. friend group, like all the people I went to high school with, all of them are popping out kids. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. And it's a lot even for someone that like I, like I said, I don't want children. It's a lot to deal with the pressure on me to still be like, but you'll change your mind, but all of that. That's not even touching on people that genuinely want kids and then suffer and go through this process. It's It's just so fucking hard. And I don't know if that's why I have the look that I do on this book is Mm. because I haven't experienced it. Oh, definitely. Our life experiences are so different and that's completely phrasing the way that we're interpreting this book. Yeah, Like I 100% see it from now that you've explained it from Mm -hmm. your like the way that you see it because yeah. it makes so much sense being so overcome by everything that you're just in tunnel vision of like yeah this is how I feel this is how you must feel because if I feel this terrible you are experiencing this as well so surely you feel like you know what I mean and, like, and rejecting you, that yeah. self-hate it's not just like oh I hate myself it's you must hate me too because mm. if I hate myself you've got to hate me more and then couple with that the disappointment every month that she experiences. Oh. Mm. There's this really good quote where she's sort of summing up how sex in particular is like a trigger for her. So the quote is, his fingers would be skimming my waist, his mouth hot and wet would find mine, his hands would be freeing me from my clothes, he would be inside me, he would make love to me, and when he stopped, I would be filled with hope. And then all that hope would eventually escape with the blood. I would be left devastated in the shower. Imagine that every month for six years. Yeah. It's in this next bit as well where we find out that Queen is besties with her sister, Ava, and she's the only one she talks to about the baby stuff, which, yeah. again, she does not have the support system she needs in place. She's not communicating. She's not asking for the help. She doesn't have it. It's not there. No. And then her sister is actually moving away as well. So that support is going to be even harder for Quinn to find. We follow that up with, again, we're also finding out more about Quinn's mother. 
she's the type that she marries for money, not love, and is an absolute asshole. That she is. I hate she her. Is she actually? She is Emily from Gilmore Girls. Yeah, that tracks. That does track. Mm-hmm. So she's catching up for this lunch that she has with Ava and her mother, and the only relief she has in seeing her mother is that she gets to see her sister because they help each other cope with their mother's antics. But while they're at this fancy, fancy lunch, one of her mother's friends shows up and she's like, oh, is that you? Oh, is that you? The fancy said you're at the country club. I haven't seen you since, oh, it's all this time. And then this motherfucker has the audacity, this woman who just shows up out of nowhere and goes, oh, queen, when are you having your baby? <sighs> Fuck that off. Fuck that right off. We need to stop asking women full stop. Stop talking to them. And then this fucking knobhead follows up her initially stupid question with, have you tried IVF? And Quinn comes out with, yes, Eleanor, I say, pulling my hand from hers. We've been through three unsuccessful rounds, actually. It drained our savings account. We had to take out a second mortgage on our home. So suck my fucking dick, Eleanor. That is not an exaggeration. That is how expensive IVF is, even in Australia with Mm, Medicare. We get a little bit more information about their infertility journey and we find out that she was diagnosed with endometriosis at 25, which has affected the quality of her eggs which means surrogacy is not likely going to be an option and because graham has a criminal record which we will discover a little bit later they aren't being accepted for any adoptions not to mention the fact that they have exhausted financially those options anyway so even if they were accepted they wouldn't be able to afford it and i just i really really appreciated the fact that the difficulty in pursuing these options wasn't glossed over it touched on everything they did an iui they've done ivf they've done they've done all of the steps and it's not working for them it is just such a heartbreaking situation where you have people who would make the most amazing parents who can't conceive and again this is this next quote is one one of those moments where obviously prior to this is me reading prior to uh, hearing Ellie's side of it which has made me understand this book a lot differently because again I'm on I'm in my tunnel vision and I'm like in this book reading it and I'm like ah why are you doing this Quinn but it's good that we all have our own opinions on it though yeah yeah Yeah, and this is this is why I like these book chats because like I now will reread this in a different light Hmm. if I reread it again because of the fact that like I have you as a friend who has experienced this book differently to what I have, which I love. I also so- really like the fact that, you know, Bryony is talking about how motherhood is like revered in society and it fucking is, but I never really thought about it. It's fucking everywhere. In that way. Mm, because I always wanted it. I, I tuned into it. And when you're saying and pointing out the fact that like, it's not for everyone. And if it's not for you, it is fucking everywhere regardless. Mm. So we get this quote, which is, I'm the infertile one, not Graham. Should he be punished by my infertility too? He says kids don't matter to him as much as I matter to him. But I know he says that because he doesn't want to hurt me and because he still has hope. But 10 or 20 years from now, he'll resent me. He's human. I think it's really common in relationships as well to preempt the fight. I don't know if you guys experience this, but I sometimes... Lucky will withhold things from me because he knows what my reaction is going to be. <laughs> and I'm like, but you don't know what my reaction is going to be. And now it's worse because you haven't told me yeah. because you thought that I was going to get mad about that. And now not only am I mad about that because you were correct, I'm now mad that you didn't tell me. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> so I will preempt the fight so much that I have the fight. Yes. It's, it's done. And then by the time Sam rolls back around, I'm like, you know what? I actually don't, I don't need it. I'm done. I'm good. Yeah. You know what? Actually, I've, I've forgiven you already. It's cool. <laughs> Which then he doesn't learn anything. We don't evolve because I've had the fight on my own. Yeah. <laughs> also that last bit of that quote where it's talking about resentment, that's something as well that I'm really trying to be mindful of at the moment. It's not the big fights. It's the little things. It's the mm-hmm. small things that can just slowly stack up. And then one day you just hate a motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it all could have been stopped if you just communicated. Definitely. But no, you were like, no, I don't need to say anything this time. Oh, this time. Oh, this time. 
and then suddenly you have this mountain and you resent this person for stuff that you've never given the opportunity to fix. You've never even told them it was an issue. And that is so fucking common. Oh my God. We follow up that horrifying common situation that's definitely hitting too close to home with this horrifying example of how hard sometimes it is, like we've said, to just exist in the world, especially when society is force feeding you a narrative. Even without social media, not a single day goes by without being reminded that I might never be a mother. Every time I see a child, every time I see a pregnant woman, every time I run into people like Eleanor, almost every movie I watch, every book I read, every song I hear, and lately, every time my husband touches me. Oh, God. Well, there's a bit at the end of the chapter that really got me. Quinn says, if I were a mother, I wouldn't take a single moment of my child's life for granted. I'd be grateful for every second they whined or cried or got sick or talked back to me. And it just makes me realise how easy it is to take for granted your normal mundane life. Sometimes it's good to check in with your own gratitude. Yeah. From there, you jump into the then again, happy days. They leave the bar. They go back to her place and she basically puts on this cute little nightgown. She's thinking they're going to get down. They're going to get dirty. But her internal monologue is feeling very uneasy, but she wants it, but she doesn't. But it's too soon, but it's not. I don't know. And he basically says that he doesn't want to be her rebound guy. And he goes to leave. And she's in bed when he leaves and she's like, oh. God, I don't know how I feel. And she gets up to go get herself a glass of water. And when she walks past the door, she sees a post-it note on the door, like, well, next to the door. And all it says is, call me someday after your rebound guy, Graham. And it has his number there. Oh. <laughs> Love a man that is secure that he's like, can you go fuck someone else that we can fuck? Literally. So then we jump into the next chapter. And this is basically... <laughs> This is where I was getting frustrated that she believes that all there is to their marriage is children. Because in my relationship right now, there is so much more to mine and Aiden's relationship than children. I wasn't very happy with the fact that what I took from her in this part of the book was that all she thought there was to their marriage was having kids. Again, I don't see it from the point of view that someone who does want kids right now does or has kids right now does because it's just not even a fathoming thing for me right now. So I was, I was very upset. I was like, it doesn't have to be that way though, Quinn. But in her mind, I guess it does because that's yeah. what her life re- revolves around right now. She's in but, a little spiral. Yeah. But I really, really love Graham because there's this quote and it is, Graham is consistent in every way possible outside of the bedroom. But inside of the bedroom, I never know what I'm going to get. Sometimes he makes love to me with patience and selflessness, but sometimes he's needy and quick and selfish. Sometimes he's talkative while he's inside me, whispering words that make me fall even more in love with him. But sometimes he's angry and loud and says things that make me blush. And we love that versatility. Yeah, look, Graham, G, bloody. You're on it. Imagine calling that out. G. <laughs> <laughs> Graham. Oh. oh. Oh, dear. Anyway. So she's initiating sex with Graham because she's ovulating, but she wants it to be over quickly. So in that versatility, she wants she wants the quick and angry bit. When he tries to slow things down a little and she, she literally says to him, it's fine, I'm ovulating. He clearly does not take this too well and says to her, it would be nice if just one time I could be inside you because you want me there, not because it's a requirement to getting pregnant. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh God. And they end up fucking after this, but he pulls out and he comes on her back instead. Oh fuck. What she did was bad, but ouch, that is real bad. <laughs> yeah. The it's, whole thing is just it's, 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 the quote that comes out is I wish I could say, I'm sorry for wanting a baby more than I want him, but I'm bitter that he doesn't understand what sex has become to me over the last few years. He wants to, me to continue to want him, but I can't when sex and making love have always given me hope that it might be the one, one in a million chance that I'll get pregnant and all the sex and love making that leads to the hope then leads to the moment all that hope is overcome by devastation <gasps> she is just in the absolute pit of this depression and she cannot get out Mm-mm. and i'm so conflicted here yes i know she's weaponized this part of their relationship as a means to an end and she holds resentment towards him for wanting to have sex with her but i think it's so accurate i mean i've had moments in my relationship after kids where I associated affection with how little I wanted to have sex because I just felt too touched out and I couldn't disassociate that in my brain in that moment. So I just avoided. 
I just avoided it. And it became a pretty awful cycle because then it became something I felt shame about and I felt guilty about, which made me want not want to do it even more. And it was awful until we talked about it and we addressed it. It got so much better. And then smart came into my life and it was like, well. <sighs> amazing. It's amazing what smart can do. But yeah, I just completely relate to this. It doesn't have to have anything to do with your partner for a toxic pattern of behavior like this to occur. So then we jump from that to the next chapter, which is again, a then chapter. And basically she's on a date. And when she's out on her date, she sees Graham. It's six months later. They meet in the hallway. They have a very like Atlas and Lily moment. It's very yeah. cute. And he says this quote, which is, I'm pretty sure I was over Sasha the day I met you. And I'm like, oh shit, it's happening. Boom, boom, yes. boom, baby. They go back to their dates and he's like trying to make her jealous. He like kisses his date on the cheek, whatever. And then she basically turns to her date and she's like, Let's get out of here, baby. It's happening. We jump into the now chapter, which is like, I'm getting fucking whiplash off. Like, <coughs> so she's on the phone to her sister and she's pregnant. And a quick little side note here for anyone this is relevant to. If you know someone who is struggling with infertility and you get pregnant, maybe tell them via text message. You're giving them the opportunity to react in private have all of their feelings and then they can respond to you. Yeah. So basically they get a notice from an adoptive agency saying that no, you cannot because of Graham's history. She doesn't tell him it's a whole thing. Uh Oh, bad. Not good. He is finally like to her, why don't we talk about this anymore? Like not being able to have babies. Why don't we not talk about the adoption? Why don't we talk about this stuff anymore? And ask her if she's finally accepted the fact that they'll never be parents. And she freaks the fuck out. The quote is, I walk away until I'm strong enough to pretend the conversation never happened. And he does what he does best. He leaves me alone in my grief because I've made it so hard for him to console me oh, mm. so we leave that heartbreaking moment I mean jump back to then so she brings Jason back to her apartment and they're making out and mentally she's like oh this is isn't fantastic and we have the comment thank god the doorbell rings and yes thank god thank G because Graham shows up I am that's who you want. He basically shows out the door and they have this whole moment where it's like, I thought you were giving me a look in the restaurant that you wanted me to come back here and fuck you. And she's like, no. <laughs> He's like, oh, this is this is awkward. But when they're looking at each other, we get this quote that just sets me on fire. And it's, Graham doesn't even touch me and I feel it everywhere. Jason touches me everywhere and I feel it nowhere. That's the fanny flutters, honey. It is. Graham is so cocky. I love it. Normally I wouldn't. I'd be like, no, take it down, but no, bring it up. Amp up the volume. I'm into it. I'm invested. Jason's like, she's like, oh, give me 15 minutes and I'll get rid of him. And Jason's just standing there like, the fuck? So he leaves and Graham's just like, you still need that 15 minutes? So he comes inside and then we have this moment. She's thinking about the way he makes her feel and it's, I'm not sure anyone has ever made me feel as beautiful as he makes me feel when he looks at me. Like it's taking everything in him to keep his mouth away from mine. That is what we want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want you to look at me like you are a starving man and I am a buffet. (laughs) Like, fuck yeah. They they go to kiss. And then she's like, wait, I was just making out with him. I really should brush my teeth first, which love you, honey. So then she brushes her teeth and they make out. And I mean, they make out. We have the, he doesn't even bother with an introductory slow kiss. His tongue is in my mouth. Like he's been there many times before and knows exactly what to do. Graham. Hell yeah. There's ass grabbing. There's legs wrapped around waist. We're on a bathroom bench. And the quote is, I try to convince myself I did not go my whole life never realizing this kind of kiss existed. The way his lips move against mine makes me question the skills of every guy that came before him. Graham, my Graham. darling, where you been all my life? Also, there is nothing worse than a bad kiss. Nothing worse. You're like, oh, we're gonna, oh, we're not gonna. No, nothing here. So he's like, actually, what's the rush? I'm gonna be here all night, darling. And I'm, I love it. I'm all here for his, uh, he's confident. And I'm like, yes. And they're basically learning things about one another. And there's this quote that's like, still talking. Quinn, Halloween is over two months away. We're we practically living together by then. <laughs> he's just like coming on, like strong, strong, so strong. strong. But I am also kind of like, thank you for showing your dominance, sir. I appreciate this. Then he comes out with like a few different quotes, which I really wanted to mention. So the first one is, what is today's date? He's so random. I lift my head and look at him. The 8th of August. Why? Just want to make sure that you never forget the date that the universe brought us back together. Ah! 
Oh, Graham. And then following that up, he's like, you'll see 10 years from now on August 8th, I'm going to roll over in our bed at midnight and whisper, I told you so in your ear. Mm. Love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Then we jump over to the next chapter, which is another now chapter. And they are going to Graham's parents' house to see Graham's nieces, which is would be nice and lovely. If it was, it's so traumatic. While they're at Graham's parents' house, we get some heartbreaking developments. I feel like a news reporter. And now for some heartbreaking developments in the story. Quinn loves being in public with Graham because it's different from when they're together in private. And that's really cruel. It's fucking terrible. It's oh. not nice. She likes it because they can be all physical and it's not like she's not attracted to him and it's not like she doesn't love him. But when they're with the family, it can't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Fuck, it's just... Except for that one time in the bathroom when (laughs) (laughs) they have this moment when they're alone in the bathroom and she allows herself to feel as he flicks her bean. And then the moment ends and they wash dishes and they dance in the kitchen. It's really cute. And, like, Graham's sister is like, oh, you guys must be, like, atrocious when you're at home because if you're like this in public and it's like, the pain is real. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) <laughs> the quote we get is my husband's heart is my saving grace but his physical touch has become my enemy oh fuck. so we go from that now chapter to another then chapter and this is the first time he asks her what he missed while she was asleep so she wakes up and he's like what you dream so she tells him about this fucking dream she has where like he he rocks up to her house in scuba gear <laughs> and taking <laughs> and takes Takes her to meet his mother. It's a whole thing, which I'm like, why is Scooby Gear? What's happening? And I'm committed to them. I'm also committed to how much Graham is very much committed to Quinn. It's Absolutely. fantastic. He's so smitten already. Like she's in the shower and he just comes in to start talking to her. Like they've been together for ages. It's day two. Yeah. And then we have this scene where he's like, my God, Quinn. He whispers, he closes the shower curtain and says, I'll be back in a little while. Right before he walks out of my bathroom, I hear him whisper, fuck. <laughs> I fucking love it so much. Mm -hmm. So much. So they're going back and forth throughout the day and he says he kept their fortunes from the day they met and he jokes that they had their number eights on them, you know, 8th of August. And he's like, haha, wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be just so cool? But no, it's a joke. Or is it? And then he gets a call from his mother and he's like, yeah, dinner sounds good. Can I bring a date? And and then he's, the quote is, he covers his phone and looks at me and says, get your scuba gear ready, (laughs) Grin. Oh, I love him. Amazing. We're doing it. But now we're depressed again, guys. <laughs> we're <Woo! laughs> back down. Let me bring you back down. Thank you. So Graham's sister has just had another baby and Quinn's going to go visit them. So it was a home birth, which sounds like it would be a lot. <gasps> um, <laughs> what? That's how I feel about birth. It was just a whole bunch of air escaping out. <laughs> At least like that's not how it happens. <laughs> Well, look, some women do make noises like that. (laughs) Anyway, Graham is already at the house. Quinn walks in and puts their gift on the coffee table and he doesn't, he can't see that she's there. He's got his back to her. He's holding his little newborn nephew in his arms. And without knowing that she's there, his sister says to him that he's a natural. Well, I think she says to him, like, I'm really sad that you guys haven't had kids yet. And he goes, I'm devastated that it hasn't happened yet. In that moment, my heart broke for Quinn. She doesn't say a word about it. She just gets in the car and gets out of there. Fuck. Can you imagine that? All of her worst fears have just been confirmed. I know. Yeah. yeah. We flash back to then and we find out that Graham is the youngest of four children. He's the only boy, but he's also just super adorable and I love him. Thank you. They're making up stories of how they met. So like he's introducing her to his family and he's just fucking ad-libbing. This man, comedic genius. I love him. And then they take a tour of, of the house and and he's admiring how pretty she is and he's like I'm not gonna lie though I really wish you could have worn your scuba gear <laughs> love that <laughs> and Graham is an ass man just FYI he absolutely is which I'm he, looking for he is not on the titty committee he is on the ass agenda Thank so you. here we are and you then they need oil <laughs> Like this, oh fuck. Anyway, shit. Then we have this very juicy, juicy moment where somehow talking about the fact that he was a virgin gets sexy and they fuck on his Star Wars comforter. In the basement of his parents' house while his parents are up. That's fine. Yeah, look, 
it's a moment and they go from basically like she orgasms from like some fanny kisses <laughs> like over panty fanny kisses. over panty fanny kisses and then she's like wow that's a lot and he's like grab the possibly expired condom <laughs> and then they fuck in the stars comforter and it's fantastic <laughs> they can't get enough of each other i can't get enough of them it's great can we just stay in the past please i know Because then you jump straight from that into the next part, which is Graham's drunk on a Thursday night, which is usual because he usually goes out and drinks with his co-workers on a Thursday. And Quinn says, seeing him drunk makes me realise just how sad he looks now when he's sober. And again, I'm kind of pissed at Quinn. She's being a little bit selfish, which again, I'm looking back at the way that Ellie looks at it and it's different, but... In my mind, she was being selfish and she's acting like she is like the only one hurting in this situation, which is I realized how much I would prefer never having sex again. That way, every month when my period comes, it would be completely expected and not at all devastating. Look, Quinn, this man, he loves you even if you don't have a child, even if you do have a child. It doesn't matter how often it is. Doesn't matter if it's like actual physical intercourse. Doesn't matter if it's just the different ways of being intimate with your partner. It is so important. Mm -hmm. You restricting that intimacy from your partner, it's going to destroy your marriage. It will. Intimacy, doesn't matter what shape, form, whatever. whatever. you define intimacy as, it is necessary. It doesn't yeah. need doesn't need to be sex. It just needs it's it's a part of being in a relationship. It's what defines you from a friendship to a relationship. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, she's just like cutting off all the time. She's like, actually, no, snap that. Actually, no, snap that. Actually, no, snap that. Bye. And she's doing it to try and save herself from the pain that she's experiencing. But she's actually making it worse for herself. Exactly. And she's causing more pain for him as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, look, you're not wrong. What she is doing is incredibly selfish. Like the fact that I empathise with her and I can see where she's coming from doesn't justify the fact that it's selfish. Just like what happens with Graham later on in the book. Like Mm -hmm. just Mm. because there's context doesn't provide an excuse. Even we don't have to agree with everything to still be like, fuck, that's rough. Yeah. And there's a quote here, which is, but he makes so many sacrifices for me. I know I should sometimes do the same for him. I just wish sex wasn't a sacrifice for me. Oh my God. I just, I'm so empathetic towards her here. It's not like she's choosing this time and time again. She's just gone through so much heartbreak and sex is now the trigger of it. We get this moment where, so they're having sex, Graham's drunk, Quinn's just basically laying there and Graham comes out with, can't you at least pretend you still want me? Sometimes I feel like I'm making love to a corpse. Ah, <sighs> that's not nice. At the start, she's kind of getting into it. And then she's like, actually, wait, I'm not ovulating right now. So I'm just going to sit here like a... Yeah, and it's like, it's just so, it's so hard and it's so messy and it's so ugly. So messy. It's Mm -hmm. so messy. Because at the same time as well, there are times when you have sex as a woman, this has happened to arguably every woman. If it hasn't, I'll be very surprised. But you have had sex when you didn't want to. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. not necessarily assault. It's not necessarily rape. It is just, you have gone, yep, I will let this happen for this relationship, for this interaction. Sure, go for gold. I'll just check out for a He wants it a lot more than I do right now. Yeah. And I don't have that, like, I'll let this happen. Arguably, there's probably been a lot of times where your partner just goes for it. The person Mm -hmm. that is having sex with you just keeps going and doesn't read the body language. Graham actually does that in this scenario. It's just unfortunate that he is drunk and comes out with that gem. Yeah. but But he actually is recognizing that his partner is not reciprocating. The body language is not there. It is not enthusiastic. And then we have the fuck up. But then Quinn comes out with this quote afterwards, which is, of course, he feels like he's making love to a corpse. It's because he is. I haven't felt alive inside in years. I've slowly been rotting away. And that rot is now eating at my marriage to the point that I can no longer hide it. We're going straight towards the shower and we are just crying in there. We're sobbing and it's very sad. When she comes out, he just grabs her and clings to her. There's this quote again. Again, which is apologies are no uh, apologies are good for admitting regret, but they do very little in removing the truth from the actions that caused the regret. Which mm-hmm. is ouch that fucking quote. Oh, don't do yeah. the don't do the thing that causes the apology. Basically, put a line under it and put it in bold and like yeah. shout it from the rooftop. Put it and on if, the fucking sign. And if there is, you can apologize that it happened, but you need to address 
what happened. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Can't just sweep it under the rug. Like Cinderella, sweep it under the rug, put it under. No, and you can't expect your apology to just be like, well, I apologize. It's done. No, you have to, that just, that's just the initial stage of doing the work. Mm-hmm. fucking whiplash okay we're back to the then and they're both totally fucking in love isn't this nice it's great i am uncomfortable because i've just gotten out from the fact that they fucking hate like well they don't hate each other but you know they're like on the brink and now i'm like ow my neck hurts anyway he doesn't know if they're moving too fast because they just are totally head over heels in love and basically they're both like fuck it and he goes at this point i don't really care how we met i only care that we met and I'm like, that is fucking beautiful. I love Isn't that. Graham. Graham. They Jane. start talking a bit about Ethan and Sasha and how to deal with marriage. And I love this analogy. Uh, you say that marriage is like a Category 5 hurricane. Not all the time, but I definitely think that there are Category 5 moments in every marriage. Mm-hmm. And that is so accurate. That's exactly right. And then following that, Graham just basically smashes out a bunch of like fucking gem quotes that I appreciate so very fucking much. And one of them is, we are all full of flaws, hundreds of them. They are like tiny holes all over our skin. And like your fortune said, sometimes we shine too much light on our floors. And then now you know exactly what to look for. When you meet someone who is good for you, they won't fill you with insecurities by focusing on your flaws. They'll fill you with inspiration because they'll focus on the best parts of you. Which is fucking beautiful. From here, Graham basically confesses to what his criminal record is. And that is that him and his best friend Tanner were at a party and he was the least drunk out of Tanner and his little brother Alex. So he drove them home, but unfortunately they got into a wreck and Tanner died. Yes. So then we jump back into the current time and look, you know, it's going to be a rough chapter when it starts with a cheating dream. So Quinn basically has a dream that Graham cheated on her. Quinn is suspicious, obviously, that Graham is cheating on her. And so the quote is, the goodbye kisses started becoming more infrequent. The hello kisses have stopped completely. He's finally stooped to my level in this marriage. He either has something to feel guilty for or he's finally done fighting for the survival of this marriage. I'm screaming, like, surely fucking not. Mm. Surely fucking not. Graham, the Graham that I know so far in this book, surely fucking Graham not. Graham wouldn't do this. No. Graham wouldn't do no, this. Graham. So then we have this moment where she's basically sitting in the dark looking out the lounge room window when he pulls in the driveway. He's sitting in his car and he doesn't realise that she can see him. And the quote is, he looks in his rearview mirror and wipes his mouth, adjusts his tie, wipes his neck, breaks my heart, sighs heavily, and then finally exits the car. He sees her when he gets inside. And the quote again, Again is he's wondering if I saw him wipe the remnants of her off his mouth off his neck he's wondering if I saw him adjust his tie he's wondering if I saw him press his head to the steering wheel in dread or regret and then we get what's her name <gasps> oh fuck Oh, oh no! At this point, I'm I'm crying. At this point, imagine being in that situation where you're you are so broken, your marriage is on the fucking rocks, and that motherfucker has the audacity. If you are not fucking happy, if it comes to that point where you are thinking of someone else in that way, you fucking leave them. Do you hear me, internet? Like you said, Georgia. At this moment, I'm absolutely pissed. I'm like Graham, as someone who has been cheated on, you do not cheat. You know the pain. Why would you do that? And I was just playing like beyond all hope that the motivation was not to punish her. I know. And I was like, then we have this quote, the tears are nothing new, but they're different this time. I'm not crying over something that never came to be. I'm crying for something that's coming to an end. Fuck. Yeah. Oh God. Sometimes it felt reading this book that I needed to like stop and okay. process what I just read before. Yeah. That's exactly right. We jump into this flashback and it's that these two are inseparable because they're so in love and happy and soulmates. Mm. It's fantastic. And that's basically what it's been. It's 10 weeks of nothing but sex, laughter, sex, food, sex, laughter, and more sex. I love that. I love that for you. And they're going to a Halloween party at Adrian Reed's, but they're late because they're so horny and I love them. You kids keep me young. (laughs) <laughs> girls are friends Ava and Reed love Graham and the quote is that man is in love with you and he wants to marry you and he wants you to have all his babies oh no. well that's very unfortunate so then just casual whiplash again we're back into heartbreak it's fantastic oh, the quote is I wonder if Andrea knows that Graham is married I wonder if she knows he has a wife at home who hasn't been able to get pregnant 
a wife who spent the entire night and the entire day locked inside her bedroom, a wife who finally pulled herself out of the bed long enough to pack a suitcase, a wife who is done. And I'm like, oh no, she's leaving him. But I'm also like, oh, you're done, are you, Quinn? Yes, this is fucking bad. But also this is one incident where you have been eating away for months. And you're going through your thing, and I completely understand that. But neither of you are doing good right now. No, no one, no one has the moral Maybe. high ground here. No, absolutely. Then she uh, gets out the uh, old wooden box, and mm. he he sees her, and he freaks out, and he says to her. I did the absolute worst thing I could possibly do to you, but please give me a chance to make things right before you open this. And I'm like, what the fuck is in the box? I know. Like, what is in the fucking box? I'm, I'm like, so surprised that at this stage, I wasn't thinking it was like someone's dead. Someone's like, dead hand or something. <laughs> it's actually his foreskin. <laughs> Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Why would they need it though? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, fucking hell. No false kiss in a box. At this point, Quinn is like, I'm done. I'm going to go stay with my mother. Bye. And if so that's she... your decision when it's Eleanor. Honestly, oh. what the fuck? So she gets in the car and she's driving to her mother's house and she rocks up and she's like, mm, no, I don't want to be here anymore. But it's too late. Her mother's already seen her in the car and she's like, oh, I can't fucking leave now. So she gets out and she is, sits on the porch and she's not in a good way. And she's basically like to her mom, why would God give someone like you children, but not me? And I'm like, oh, yeah, get her. And, um, her mum kind of opens up and says she did her best. Like, soz bros, I actually wanted to travel the world with your dad for a couple of years. But then we had kids, lols. This is one of the reasons I don't want children. I don't want to bring a child into the world and then resent them for having to change my life. I'm selfish. I want my life my way. And I don't want to then put that on some innocent kid. And I think it is fucking fantastic that you have that perspective. Absolutely. Because too many people do not and they continue to have children and they continue to be miserable. Exactly. And then their children grow up to be miserable too. Um, but it's fine. Quinn's mum doesn't make that decision. Instead was like, why not have two children? Then they can suffer together. Exactly right. Give Fuck it up. We then jump back into another flashback where they go to visit her mum in the past. It's the first time they met. Her mum is just being an actual turd as per usual. Graham, however, is not being a turd. Graham is being an absolute gentleman. Like we know he is. We've... So the quote is, being here, meeting your mother and seeing where you came from and who you somehow turned out to be. It's inspiring, Quinn. I don't know how you did it. You selfless, amazing, incredible woman. Oh my God. And then Quinn comes out with, a lot of people can't pinpoint the exact moment they fall in love with the person. I can. It just happened. And I'm oh. like, oh. And then in like he grabs her, the foreheads are touching. It's a whole moment. I love the forehead touching. I love the forehead touching. That's also one of my favorite. Is that a trope? It is now. Yep. <laughs> and they say, and they say, I love you, and I'm done. I'm like, oh, I'm convinced they're in love. I'm happy. Everything. And they do that thing, like they're very in sync. Because right now they're communicating and everything's fantastic. And so, like, she's thinking that and he's saying it and it's just... Yeah. Isn't that unfortunate? Because then you whiplash straight back to the next part. Which is, uh, we're just fucking spiralling. She basically comes home and he's out. He comes out because she's sitting in her car. He comes out and he sits in the car with her and basically asks why they never got a dog. And at that moment, I'm like, this is not the time, Graham. <laughs> and I mean, Quinn's reaction is fairly sad. She's like, who are you right now and what did you do with my husband and graham's response is he's probably somewhere with my wife it's been a while since i've seen her oh god and they're having this awful awful painful conversation that's essentially not it's also not the conversation they need to be having it's just getting things out and it's not great so there's the quote you don't hate me he says quietly in order to hate me you'd have to love me but you've been indifferent toward me for a long time now oh fuck oh, god shit Fuck like shit. she's literally convinced him that she doesn't love him and she's like get the fuck out and he admits that he never slept with andrea quinn's internal monologue is he didn't sleep with her does that make a difference does it hurt less no does it make me less angry at him no not even a little bit the fact is graham was intimate with another woman it wouldn't matter if that consisted of a conversation a kiss or a three-way fuckathon betrayal hurts the same on any level when it's your husband doing the betraying he goes on to confess what actually happened between him and andrea he wants to give he her all of the details andrea reminded him of her and he came home and quinn would avoid him and ignore him and he, he was so hurt and frustrated that he 
kissed Andrea the next night. Quinn is like, that does not make it any better. And he's like, I know, but you can't kiss someone because she reminds you of your wife. If you want, like talk, talk, communicate as hard. as hard as it is to have the conversation. This is worse. This is worse. <laughs> this so this conversation God. is worse. Mm-hmm. So we again get this quote and it honestly rips my soul from my body. Fuck the me quotes up. are, we walk around inside that house like everything is okay, but it's not Quinn. We've been broken for years and I have no idea how to fix us. I find solutions. It's what I do. It's what I'm good at, but I have no idea how to solve me and you. Every day I come home hoping things will be better, but you can't even stand to be in the same room with me. You hate it when I touch you. You hate it when I talk to you. I pretend not to notice the things you don't want me to notice because I don't want you to hurt more than you already do. Mm. And you're going, oh, everything that she thinks he doesn't notice, he does. He notices. We follow that up with, I'm not blaming you for what I did. It's my fault. It is my fault. I did that. I fucked up, but I didn't fuck up because I was attracted to her. I fucked up because I miss you. Every day I miss you. When I'm at work, I miss you. When I'm home, I miss you. When you're next to me in bed, I miss you. When I'm inside you, I miss you. Fuck. There are no excuses. There's context, but there's no excuses. However, this is rough for everyone. I am just so conflicted this entire this entire time because I'm like, okay, he understands what he fucking did. And this is something that I appreciate when someone fucks up and they're like, I fucked up. Mm-hmm. I want you to forgive me. It's in your fucking court, but I fucked up. Mm-hmm. When you can grab it by the fucking dick and make it your bitch, like, yes, I did this. I'm a fucking, I'm a fuckhead, but here we are. Also, I'm a big fan. This is going to be controversial. Mm. I'm a big fan of Will Smith and Jada. Ooh, let's get into it. I love Red Table Talk. It is one of my favourite shows. Mm. And I like Esther Perel and her conversations. And cheating is not necessarily the end of a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's infidelity and infidelity can be a lot of things. It's not necessarily physical intimacy. It can be a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're willing to define your own relationship and communicate and work on things and have your boundaries that you keep, Mm. I'm like, can we come back from this? Mm. (laughs) Do we need a red table? (laughs) Someone call Jada. (laughs) Just not Will. Will needs a timeout at the moment. So we then continue on with the heartbreak and he goes, I miss you, Quinn, so much. You're right here, but you aren't. I don't know where you went or when you left, but I have no idea how to bring you back. I am so alone. We live together. We eat together. We sleep together together but I have never felt more alone in my entire life. And my heart fucking broke for him because I was like, I can see where he's coming from in that first half of the book because I felt alone with him. I Mm. felt that I saw Quinn's trauma. I I saw how Quinn was feeling, but where the fuck is how Graham is feeling? Because Graham Mm -hmm. is still a person in this relationship who is dealing with the trauma of not being able to be a father. And even if he doesn't even care about being a father, he's seeing the person that he loves more than anything being destroyed by this. Yep. And that is enough for me to just send. And he feels powerless to do anything. Mm. He doesn't know Mm. what to do. Yeah. and But again, I'm conflicted because I am so fucking mad at him right now. Mm. We do not forgive the cheating. We do not forget that happened. It's just fucked. Fucked, exactly. I also don't like the fact that the wording of all of this sounds like he's blaming her. I know. There is a lot of things, yeah. Mm. There are a lot of things throughout this book that, Mm. like, when, like, there were certain moments where I was like, okay, Mate, you still fucked up. Mm. <laughs> yes, she was a bit of a cunt, but like we all are. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then basically Quinn is like, I'm here, but you are still searching for the person who I used to be. And he is just like so distressed. He is so upset in this entire moment because I think he's like, I fucked up. I've done the worst thing that I could ever have possibly done. And I was the one that was holding on for this marriage. And now he's like, this is what's going to end us because I did this. And so he turns around and he's like, I have loved you every single second of every day since the moment I laid eyes on you. I love you more now than I did the day I married you. I love you, Quinn. I fucking love you. And again, I am so conflicted between my anger towards her, towards him. And I'm just like, what the actual fuck is going on with my emotions? Oh fuck. God. But why not we go on a little holiday now, guys? Let's Whip go back to the <laughs> We're on a beach. Things are great. We have this quote. It's funny how you can be so happy with someone and love them so much. It creates an underlying sense of fear in you that you never knew before them. The fear of losing them. The fear of them getting hurt. 
I imagine that's what it's like when you have children. It's probably the most incredible kind of love you ever know, but it's also the most terrifying. Do did you just drink straight from the gin bottle? <laughs> Ooh. I'm emotional. Oh my god. <laughs> anyway, I 100% relate to this. I think I've said this before, but I distinctly remember being in hospital after having Charlie and thinking my heart is now on the outside of my body. It literally just like hit me like, oh my god, you are my entire world. And if something happened to you, I would not cope. And basically she asked him if he wants kids. And he does. And that's basically, we find out that is all she wants to do. All she wants to do is be a mother. That's all she's ever wanted to do. And then Graham is like, actually, ask me if I want kids again. And my heart in this fucking moment, it smashed a million pieces. She asks him if he wants kids again. And he says, I only want kids if I can have them with you. I want to have lots of kids with you. I want to watch your belly grow. And I want to watch you hold our baby for the first time. And I want to watch you cry because you're so deliriously happy. And at night, I want to stand outside the nursery and watch you rock our babies to sleep while you sing to them. I can't think of anything I want more than to make you a mother. Oh, (sighs) literally oh my god fuck me up and then after this he's just like actually you know what would be great because Quinn funnily enough she likes to write so he goes she's got the skills she's got the skills he's like I want you to write me a love letter put all the juicy details in it how you felt when we met and she's like all right I'll do that no worries and then whip it back we're now in present time again oh no George is drinking straight from the bottle again that's a big oh. drink that's a big sip oh George why would you do that oh my god it burns so so much. So we go from that beautiful, lovely moment right back to the heartbreak. Quinn is wondering if anything would have been different if they had had kids. The quote is, maybe a child wouldn't have changed our marriage and instead of just being an unhappy couple, we would have made an unhappy family. And then what would that make us? Just another married couple staying together for the sake of the children. Oh, oh God. Oh. Look, I know normally you would have been like Brownie, Ellie, Georgia why are you not telling them to go to therapy and that's because they've already tried it didn't work I see it yeah. we're on the therapy advocates here we are and unfortunately mm-hmm. they did not find the right fit we get this also this heartbreaking quote which is the reason he allowed himself to fuck up is because he gave up on us oh god she wants to hate him but she can't she reminisces on when she went and interviewed a married couple that had been together for 60 years and the advice the old man gave gave her was that our marriage hasn't been perfect. No marriage is perfect. There were times when she gave up on us. There were even more times when I gave up on us. The secret to our longevity is that we never gave up at the same time. And I love that as well, because that that is very true. That is so fucking yeah. true. And she's realizing that they are. But then it gets worse and you're like, how? How could this get worse? And Colleen's like, well, I've had this little idea just sitting in my trauma bank waiting to bust this one out. And so she gets into bed and then you know a pain rips through me and I clench at my shirt as I lean forward I'm so heartbroken I can actually physically feel it and you're like that's interesting and then we go on so while they're in bed he confesses that he quit his job because he couldn't bear to be at the place where he made the worst decision of his life you're like oh That's not so bad, Bryony. What were you talking about? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. She wakes up and she's in pain and she is feeling around in the bed and she's like, why is it slippery? And then she says, Graham, and he's immediately turning the light on and there's blood everywhere. He rushes her to the hospital and immediately I'm like, no. I know. No. I I was just fucking screaming. So she comes out of surgery and she's shocked because she's like, what's happening? And they're like, Graham's there and he's like holding her and he's like, you've had a miss miscarriage you were three months pregnant she's like three months pregnant how could I be three months pregnant like oh she's focusing on the fact that she was pregnant Mm -hmm. she's like I was pregnant and his face is not getting excited on that fact and we have this moment where she's just only hearing bits and pieces because she's she knows what's coming and she's blacking it out and she's breaking she was hemorrhaging and the quote is I curl up and I hug my knees squeezing my eyes shut as soon as I hear the word hysterectomy I start crying sobbing then Graham crawls into the hospital bed wraps himself around me holding me as we let go of every single ounce of hope that was left between us that's just that like so that fucked. is literally the worst like for that to happen oh. and the fact that that happens you know and it just this is the this is the thing this is the fucked thing when fiction books take on something that is so fucking real this 
happens to people. And that breaks me because no one deserves to have, well, women are the only ones that can have this situation that Quinn is right now personally dealing with. Go, like, no one else can have that. Yeah. Like, it has you to can be, the be there and experience your partner having a miscarriage. You can experience your partner having to have a hysterectomy because they're hemorrhaging, but that cannot be you having the hysterectomy, Mm -hmm. having the hemorrhage, having the miscarriage, not being able to carry a child, not being able to ever have that possibility, even if it was hard. Oh, it just fucking broke my heart. Mm. I was fucked at this point. I was fucking. It's interesting because like as tragic and heartbreaking as it is, it almost gave them the closure they needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like if you always have that door slightly open where there's like the one in a million chance of you being that miracle and having the baby once you stop trying, it's always going to be in the back of your head. No one should ever have to go through something that traumatic in order to have their relationship finally snap back together. And that's not what happened to them. They still had to put in the work, clearly. Mm. Yeah. So we then whip it fucking back. They decide to talk about politics because why the fuck not? After that, why the fuck not? Anyway, so he has some good views they speak about religion and they both basically believe in something and he turns around and he says if god didn't believe in me then i'd have to believe that you were just a coincidence and you being a coincidence in my life is a lot harder for me to fathom than the mere existence of a higher power which i'm like you're fucking beautiful we then go literally fucking balls deep and the quote is be my wife quinn whether the category five moments with me And she says, yes. It's beautiful. I love it so much. Let's rip our hearts out some more, shall we? We find out it was a cervical ectopic pregnancy, which is very rare. So brief story time for you all. I went through something very, very similar. I didn't get a diagnosis. I didn't get any diagnosis because I didn't really know what it was, but they assumed it was that and I was treated for that. Essentially, I had a mass somewhere between my fallopian tube and my cervix, which shouldn't have been there. And I had the pregnancy hormone in my bloodstream. So immediate alarm bells, admitted into hospital, all of the things, all of the testing. Like Lockie and I were in a position then when we weren't thinking about kids at that point of time, but it made us be like, oh shit, like, okay. What is very confronting going through something like that though, is when you rock up to hospital, you go to a hospital where they ladies have babies. Like I remember I was sitting in a waiting room about to go in to see a doctor to be administered a drug that was going to expel whatever this mass was from me because it wasn't big enough that I needed surgery, but it needed to come out. So I had that, but you were sitting in the waiting room waiting to go in opposite a woman in labor. And I then got taken into the ward and I was in a public room. So there's just like a little curtain separating you from the next person. And the doctors come in to the person next to me on the other side of the curtain. And she said, look, I'm really sorry to say that this is another miscarriage. They had this personal conversation right next to us. And just down the hall, we could hear a woman giving birth. It was just the most fucked up experience. And it's given me a lot of perspective to women who experience miscarriage, which isn't isn't what I had, but it was enough of, I guess, that experience for us to be like, well, shit. And I guess that's what really made me go, fuck, if we can't have kids, that's going to fuck me up. Like that is really going to fuck me up if I'm... In that position of the woman on the other side of the curtain, I don't know how I'm going to cope. I honestly take my hat off to women. I love women. I think we are the best. But I also fucking hate being a woman. Mm. I fucking hate it. Let's just yeah. say men had to deal with half of the shit that we have to deal with. There would be a lot of different systems in place. No mm-hmm. shit. And I guess that's what makes me empathise with Quinn because in that moment, I didn't communicate. I I felt communicating was too hard. I didn't want to get upset about it. So I didn't because yeah. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. And if you just keep telling yourself that for long enough, you feel fine, but then you're not really addressing the issue. Yeah. That poor fucking woman, Quinn, that would have just been it a nightmare because she would have woken up on the labor ward. The poor thing. And then basically the doctor comes in and Graham is very stressed because Graham's thinking that the stress that he put her through with the whole cheating situation has made her have this miscarriage. And the doctor basically turns around and says, no, like, 
the pregnancy was doomed from the get-go. And Quinn turns around to him and says, you have a lot to feel guilty for, but my miscarriage is not one of them. In that moment, I was very proud of Quinn for saying that. I was Mm. because I would have been a petty fucking bitch. She (laughs) says, it's a little morbid that I would go through this entire thing again if I could just have, if I could have just known I was pregnant for one single day. (sighs) Which again, that is just like fucked up for society putting this type of pressure on women that you would go through a hemorrhage, a miscarriage and a hysterectomy just to feel like a mother for one day. Mm -hmm. Like that's fucked. And we followed that up with this quote where obviously they've gone through this, but there's all these other issues that existed before the miscarriage and it's everything feels so unfinished between us. We hadn't resolved anything before the miscarriage and now it just feels like the decision we were about to make has been put on hold. He gets in the bed with her and they comfort each other and the quote is, part of me wasn't sure if I wanted him in the bed with me, but I soon realised that falling asleep and our shared sadness is somehow more comforting than falling asleep alone. Progress, progress. Progress. And again, it's like she needed that closure to be able to... Yes. I truly believe like it does feel like by the end of this, before the miscarriage, it's got that level, it's an obsession. Mm. It is fixated. Nothing else matters. Everything is warped and her reality is twisting around this idea of this thing that she wants. And she's not seeing the real world in some cases Mm. because she's just so in her own spiral. Like an addiction. It is. And so she gets this hard reset, which is so heartbreaking that this is how it had to happen. Mm. It is. Yeah. So basically she ends up calling Ava when she's in the hospital and Ava's like, I'm coming to see you. And Quinn's like, actually, no, I want to come and see you because I need to still, I'm still processing what has happened between myself and Graham. Then we go to the next chapter again. Fuck me up. Whiplash is at an all time high right now. She is very stressed the fuck out about their wedding. Graham has noticed and he says, this quote which is if I was oblivious to your emotional state I would merely be a man in love with you but I'm more than that I'm your soulmate and I can feel everything you're feeling and I was like that is fucking beautiful they decide well let's just fucking get married without the big wedding and yes this is what I want to do we jump back to now and she's at Ava's she's been there for about three weeks and she hasn't seen Graham since then they've spoken maybe once and she's been pulling herself back together but ding dong Graham's there he's like knock 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 hello it is trauma Tuesday we need to discuss our feelings and they're about to have the talk and he's like I can't wait any longer we need to do this the quotes are like she asks him if it's about sex and he's like what I want more than anything is for you to be my wife. Oh, fuck off. Absolutely fucking rip my soul out of my body and eat it. He follows that up. He's like, yep, I, I see that sentiment, Georgia. I can do that. And the quote is, I fell in love with you and I committed to you because I wanted to spend the rest of my life with you. That's all I cared about when I said my vows. But I'm starting to realise that maybe you didn't marry me for the same reasons. I'm already, like, in fucking tears at this point. Like, I don't know if you guys can see. <laughs> Done. Good more gin. And we kind of get that, yeah, that, that, that sounds bad. That sounds pretty accurate, Graham. The argument sort of kicks off from there. He implies that his affair is the worst thing that has ever happened to her. And she's like, <laughs> fuck off. She basically says to him, clearly you have no idea how it feels for your uterus to be abysmal at its only fucking job. And very true. He does not because he does not not own a uterus. uterus. Strap in. But like, so she's screaming that at him. She is basically going off. You've got like nearly like a page and a half of just ranting. She's going, but he's calm. And that made me love him more that he just stood there and was like, yes. Mm. I he's just taking it and he's also like get it out the quote is no matter how hard I try no matter how much I love you I can't be the one thing you've always wanted me to be Quinn I will never be a father oh Georgia is literally just swinging straight swinging (laughs) she really is she's literally swinging straight from the (laughs) box oh that went down the wrong hole so we followed that up with if this is what our marriage is, if this is all it will ever be, just me and you, will that be enough? Am I enough for you, Quinn? Yes, you are, my little garden gnome. <laughs> That's what I'd call him. If he, if Lockie was Graham, he'd just be my little garden gnome. Oh, my God. <sighs> and the silence that lingers between his question and my answers creates the biggest misunderstanding our marriage has ever seen. Oh, no. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> no. Quinn! You fucking silly bitch. <laughs> 
I'm screaming at her. I'm so fucking screaming. We're all screaming because she's finally made the breakthrough, but she was fucking quiet, wasn't she? So then he doesn't understand. And it's the quote, I want to fall to my knees and tell him that if on our wedding day, someone had forced me to choose between the possibility of having children or spending a life with Graham, I would have chosen life with him. Without a doubt, I would have chosen him. You forgot that, bitch. Where you did that go? That. But then it gets lost in the trauma of what she's been through. It like does. he can't go back to the wedding day. He comes out of the bedroom and instead of holding his suitcase, it's the box of the foreskin. <gasps> it's and the foreskin box, we're here. What's in the box today? The point is, <laughs> the point is his loving, caring, selfless arms pull me to him. And even though we're on opposite sides of this war, he refuses to pick up his weapons. Oh, no! So she decides that it's time to open the box. And the quote is, I pull away from his chest. I open the box. We finally end the dance. I'm gonna fucking die. Ah! Oh! So, whiplash, round 57. They've gotten married. He gives her the box as a present. It doesn't actually have a foreskin in it. Surprise, surprise. The letter that she wrote him that night when they were on their little holiday, he put that in the box. He's actually written her one too. And we basically find out that the box will either be opened on their 25th wedding anniversary or it will be if they're wanting a divorce. It'll be when they're ending their wedding. Category wedding's. five. Category five. Rest in peace, my soul. Jesus has taken it. Rightio. We find out that it wasn't just the two letters in the box. It's also his foreskin. And he's been adding more to it. Anyway, he takes his letter and he leaves. She opens the letter and he starts off by writing this very cheesy poem, which is actually quite lame. Then he goes into the first day he met her. And it wasn't in the hallway. It was actually at a Christmas show of Ethan's. She joked about looking like one of the caterers and then proceeded to get like a champagne bottle and was like filling everyone's drink and Ethan was embarrassed about her and she was like, oh, fuck off and kept doing her thing. And he tells her that he loved her from the moment they reconnected. Oh my God. Basically from this point onwards, there is just bang, bang, letter, quote, letter, quote, letter, quote. So strap the fuck in. Here we go. My favorite Strap in your titties. It's Strap in your fucking titties. Strap in your heart because it's about to be ripped the fuck out of your chest. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Can you tell that I'm very intoxicated? That was so aggressive. (laughs) Quote number one. If for some reason you're opening this box because our marriage didn't work out how we thought it would, let me first tell you how sorry I am because I know we wouldn't read these letters early unless we did absolutely everything we could to prevent it. The next one. I think that's the difference in the marriages that survive and the marriages that don't. Some people think the focus in a marriage should be put on all the perfect days. They love as much and as hard as they can when everything is going right. But if a person gives all of themselves in the good times, hoping that the bad times never come, they may not be enough resources or energy left to withstand those category five moments. He writes down basically a list of promises to her and it ends with, and I promise, I swear that I love you more as you read this letter than I did when I wrote it. The next letter, he basically notes down all the little things and it just fucking breaks me. He says, I love you, Quinn. And even though the tone of this letter was kind of depressing, the strength of my love for you is at its greatest. This isn't a category five moment, maybe more of a category two, but I promise you that I'm loving you harder this year than any any year that came before it because each letter is basically their progression through their life so like the IVF they're finding out that they can't have children they're struggling to have children the IVF it's all like these are the moments that he's writing these letters the fucked moment so then we go to the next letter this is where he mentions he is going to stop asking about her dreams so he mentions that they've been married for five years and they've given up on IVF and he speaks about how much it hurts him to see her the way that she is last Sunday when you woke up I asked you what I missed while you were sleeping you stared at me with this blank look in your eyes you were silent for a little while and I thought you were trying to figure out how to relay your dream but then your chin started to quiver when you couldn't stop it you pressed your face into your pillow and you started to cry and then he ends it with I will continue to love you more and more every struggle we face that I loved you when all was perfect. So then we get to the final letter that's in the box. And this is the letter that he wrote when he was on the plane flying to Ava's house. The first quote is, I truly believed we can make it through the category fives we faced, but I think this year has been a category six. As much as I hope I'm wrong and as much as I don't want to admit it, I have a feeling we'll be opening this box soon, which is why I'm on a flight to your sister's house right now as I write this letter. I'm still fighting for something I don't even 
even know that you still want me to fight for. So we go from there and he mentions how he knows she was at his sister's house the night he met his nephew. And the quote is, the reason I said I was devastated, it still hadn't happened yet, is because I was devastated for you, for our future. Because it wasn't until that moment that I realized I might never be enough for you. I've been fighting for so long to be the strength you need, but that was the first time it occurred to me that I may not be what brings you strength anymore. What if I'm part of what brings you pain? You could love your wife more than any man has ever loved a wife, but one harrowing battle with infertility could turn a couple's love into resentment. Oh my God. This is my favorite quote of the entire fucking book. Mm, This book, are you fucking ready? I promise to love you more as a childless woman than I would love you as a mother. And I promise, I swear that if you choose to end things between us, I will love you more as you're walking out that door than on the day that you walk down the aisle. That is fucking destroy him. So she finished the letters and he's holding her even though he doesn't know what decision she has made. The quote, I love you more in this moment than any moment that has come before it. Thank God. It's only taken us 28 <gasps> chapters. George is dying because she's literally drinking straight from a bottle of gin. Oh, okay. So we then jump and she has gotten him a present, which I really fucking enjoy. And basically she's made a blanket. She's made a blanket of all of their ripped shirts because when he gets home and they just make it a game of just ripping each other's clothes off. So all of his ripped work shirts, she's just like made into a big blanket. And I think it's fucking hilarious. But they decide to try for a baby. Oh, that's and he right. says to her, I love that you love me so much. It sometimes makes you cry. And I love that the idea of us having a baby makes you cry. I love how full of love you are, Quinn. We go from that where Quinn asks Graham where he thinks they will be in 10 years' time. And he goes on to describe the perfect picket fence life and then says, Oh, he adds, maybe nothing will change. Maybe we'll still live in an apartment. Maybe we'll be struggling financially because we keep moving from job to job. We might not even be able to have kids. So we won't have a big yard or even a minivan. We'll be driving our same shitty cars 10 years from now. Maybe absolutely nothing will change and 10 years from now our lives will be the same as they are now and all we'll have is each other both sound perfect to her okay so we flash forward to the now they wake up after she's just cried herself to sleep in his arms it's very beautiful he asked her what he missed while she was sleeping and i die i'm just done and the quote is you've always been enough for me always anyway they go out and they decide you know what pancakes and she wanders past the box and she because she, and she's like actually i remember when i wrote that love letter for him i put a nude photo in there i want to see what i looked like back then let me take a quick squeeze she opens up the box and she's like actually what the fuck is in the bottom of this box there's the post-it note that he left on the side of her like next to her door And there's also the fortunes of the day, like, well, (gasps) the second time that they met. But she looks at them and she's like, what the fuck? There really was two number eights on the back of each of these fortunes. And he turns around to her and says, I didn't want you to fall in love with me because of fate. He says, closing the box. I wanted you to fall in love with me simply because you couldn't help yourself. I love this man. I love this man so much. He's just amazing. He's just a little perfect little garden gnome. Love that garden note. Oh, she finds out that he didn't need to read her letter because he didn't need to. He's going to hold on to it for their 25th anniversary. He didn't give up. He didn't give up at the same time as her. Mm. So they decide to move to where Ava and Reed are because they're like, you know what? Why the fuck not? We can. So they do. It's fantastic. I love that for them. Yeah, no. But- we get this flashback with their fortunes, as we said, and um, he has hers memorised. If you only shine light on your flaws, all your perfects will dim. It makes so much sense now. It, it does. does. It comes full circle when we've got the closure and when it's just fantastic. <laughs> so then we're, in, we're aggressively into the epilogue here. It's this beautiful little moment. They're shopping for Max, their nephew. The lady at the counter asks about them and if they have any children and they've got a new game. They just make up the most out outrageous story for their life so it's like we have seven children they're all girls <laughs> like, they're wow. named after all the spices yes. yes and then we have this amazing moment where they have a flat tire and graham is like yes graham is fangirling he's like i have waited my whole life for this moment and she's changing the tire and he is just like on the footpath being like that's my wife my wife has got this my wife that my is my wife. wife everyone just like stopping people yeah. passing by being like that's my wife she's got this like 
She's changing this tire. Look at her. She's amazing. That's a secure man and I love it. And then she is like, okay, I'm done. You can stop fangirling. I'm going to go inside, wash my hands really quick. So she walks inside the nearest store, which just happens to be a pet store. She's walking down and she's, as she's walking towards the back, she sees this tiny little dog. And I am done at this point because I'm like, as soon as there is a dog mentioned, that's it for me. And there's this quote. I stare at him for a moment because he's staring right back at me. Two big brown eyes looking at me like I'm the 50th person to walk past him today. But he still somehow has hope in those eyes. Like maybe I'll be the first one to actually consider adopting him. I step closer to his cage, which is flanked by several empty cages. He's the only dog in the whole store. I feel a tightening in my chest every time I make eye contact because seeing him so full of hope, but so scared of disappointment makes me sad. This puppy reminds me of me, of how I used to feel. Oh my God. Quinn calls out to Graham and she's like, hey, you need to come here right this fucking second. And he walks in and she's like, look, look, look at, look at the baby. And he says, hey, do you want to come home with us? Tears immediate tears continuing on so we basically find out that ava is pregnant again and this time they are having a girl basically ava is she's having a conversation with quinn and she's like why the fuck do you have a name for your puppy yet it's been like two or three weeks or something like that and quinn's like we just haven't found the right one it's fine and it just so happens that this same night is a very special moment he wakes her up at midnight and she's like what the fuck is going on And he's like, it's the 8th of August, 10 years later, and we're happily married. I told you so. (laughs) I'm like, you're petty and I love it. (laughs) And in that moment, Quinn's like, light bulb, you know what we should name the dog? August. Eight. (laughs) (laughs) And not not the number eight, but A-T-E. Yeah, eight. (laughs) A-T-E. Eight. <laughs> no, Eight. they call the puppy August and it's very fucking cute and it's very fitting for them and I really liked it. So mm-hmm. that's it. That's that's the that is the book in a beautiful little traumatic bow. Thank you for tuning in for another Trauma Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome for the, the suffrage. We're we're here for that. Okay. Music reference, I have one for you. Alex and Sierra. <gasps> Do you know this couple? They went on X Factor or America's Got Talent, something like that, and they did the Toxic. Maybe. Britney Spears. They are all, mm, mm. And they were in a relationship when they did it. And mm. Anyway, this song, Little Do You Know, is what it's called. So it starts off with the girl singing, Little do you know how I'm breaking while you fall asleep. Little do you know I'm still haunted by the memories. Little do you know I'm trying to pick myself up piece by piece. And then the guy goes, I'll wait. I'll wait. I I love you like you've never felt the pain. I'll wait. I promise you don't have to be afraid. I'll wait. Love is here and here to stay. That's fucking traumatic. Yeah. And look, it's it's amazing. When you listen to the whole song and it's, it's honestly like, you you cry. Mm, it's like her trauma, like thinking he doesn't see it. Oh, I'm crying. <sighs> And then he comes out and he's like, I do see it. It's, it's Quinn and Graham. So coming up next week, we are reading Sinner, which is another book by Sierra Simone, the second book in the Priest series. That is. Oh. Yep. So you know that fever dream that happened? It's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. Four skins coming back. Oh, God. Buckle but- in for vegetable oil being used in places that vegetable oil should not oh, the oil on this woman so we're going to be getting um stuck into some more smutty books moving forward because that's what i love to cover and it seems that you a lot of you guys that are tuning in are also coming from our tiktoks which means you guys also like smutty books we love it so the next book we are covering is one of my smut busters it is sabotage by Chantel tessia it's one of my favorite smut books i reckon i've read this year it's a little bit like again it's not for everyone these books are a lot but if you take your head out of the game and you're like this is a fiction book that is literally porn you'll be fine strap in your titties let's fucking go after we read that one we've just pulled a book from the fishbowl mm. and we need to give our girl ellie some time to get through it because it's a chonky boy i feel like you guys are gonna love it 
Um, it's from Blood and Ash. Hey. Book one. <laughs> Here we go. So we'll be reading our two smart busters. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to be reading from Blood and Ash. And that will probably come out after our Q&A episode. Yeah. Don't forget, guys, to like, follow, subscribe to all the socials. We're everywhere. We're literally like herpes. So <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't be the one doing this. We're like a bad one. rash. <laughs> we are. Uh, yes. So please go see us on our socials. We enjoy the interaction. So comment on our shit. Send us DMs. We don't fucking care. Do whatever. If you Talk want a book. Us. If you have a book that you want us to read, literally just send us like the Amazon link and we'll be like, cool, done. Let's go. Let's buy it. We're, that's it. We're we're in for a treat next week. We're in for some smarty, smarty books. Anyways, we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye, Bye guys.